podcast dedicated to the music, movies, and culture of Generation X. Mr. Vaughn, what we are dealing with here is a perfect engine, uh, an eating machine. It's really a miracle of evolution. All this machine does is swim and eat and make little sharks. And that's all. Now, why don't you take a long, close look at this sign? Those proportions are correct. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs> what is up slackers and welcome to another episode of the stuck in the middle podcast and the summer is just about upon us so i am your host jason eck and this past week i ended up having uh the first graduation in my family my first high school graduation in my family where my oldest son uh walked the stage really exciting and that's like the first piece of okay Summer is coming, but also it's more than just summer. It's going to be a, a kind of a change for us as we head in, into this fall. So it'll be the, the last summer with him home. At the same time, this week that we're in right now, uh, my youngest is going to be graduating from eighth grade, and uh, he will be a high schooler next year. So that's also kind of another milestone. But there's another thing that happens when you get to summer and they, they have now the, the industry that I'm speaking of is Hollywood. They've now shifted some timetables. So you want to be releasing movies on a regular schedule and the bigger studios are always trying to have like a quarterly release, right? Cause they have some certain times of year where they're like, they're trying to hit certain numbers, right? So they, the Marvel universe, for example, they like to stagger things throughout the year. But what's always been kind of a thing, well, not always, and we're going to talk about that, is the summer blockbuster. Now, right now, I know in theaters is Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, I have not seen the newest one. One of the things we'll talk about is how, you know, I don't really get to go to the movies very often. In fact, it's it's exceedingly rare, to be honest. So one of my kids, particularly when they were younger, had some really strong sensory issues, which means that the loud sounds of, of a great Dolby surround sound at a movie theater could be very overwhelming for someone who has any kind of sensory issues. So whenever we could go to a movie, we went to this place called Chunky's. Now that was, uh, well, I guess it still exists, but it's, I think, only in New Hampshire now. But it's New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and basically it's Chunky Cinema Pub. So you can have a full dinner, you could have beers, wine, what have you, and you sit at like a long table, like you would in a dining room, and you get to watch the movie. But because it is at like a like a dinner setting, the music tended to be like the sounds, the sound effects, all of it tend to be tempered versus going in like I don't know what is it called now, Dolby Axios or whatever it is, Atmos, I think is what it is. So it's a little bit easier, particularly for younger kids. So that's really the only time we ever went to movies was we would go to Chunky's and, you know, it would be a little easier, a little bit easier. So we do now go to the movies on occasion, but I'm trying to think about, you know, when it was that I was a regular moviegoer. And if I even was as much as a, a moviegoer as I think I am or was. So this episode is all about the summer blockbuster. Now, according to most historians, and we let off the show with a little clip from what is arguably the first summer blockbuster. Now, that, of course, is 1975 Jaws. Now, this is a Steven Spielberg joint, as everyone knows. And let's see here. So 1975 Adjusted for inflation, $1.15 billion at the box office. Now, at the time, it was $260 million. Not a slouch in, in any way, shape, or form. So here's the thing. I was born in 74, right? 
Oh, sorry, having some technical issues at the moment. Oh, uh, this is not allowing me to do. This is really riveting. Get to hear me talk about things not working on my screen. All right, I'm going to adjust this, adjust that. And let's see if that does the trick. It does the trick. Okay, so this came out in 1975. So I was only a year old. But if you're like me, I had family who played piano. And one of the easiest things to teach a little kid is... Doo -doo 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 -doo. So as long as I can remember, I, I remember Jaws being a thing. But I also remember my mom in particular talking about how that was a first big blockbuster, making movies, this kind of summer event, where there's some big tentpole from some major studio, major director, and this became kind of a theme. What's so interesting, though, is that Jaws is classified as a, classified as a horror movie. I, I guess when you look back on it, you could say, yeah, I guess, I guess it is a horror movie. This is based on uh, Peter Benchley's novel about an enormous great white shark, of course, that is a, a fictional New England town. I think it's called like Amity something, right? Which is so funny just because that's such a New England thing, like Amity, Amityville, et cetera. But this was like Steven Spielberg's like first big, huge breakthrough. Like now he is the guy, right? What a great cast. Robert Shaw, Roy Scheider, and Richard Dreyfuss. But that was the first big one, and... It's always been part of my consciousness, frankly. And part of that is because all of my family are saying that was the one. And it is, uh, when I was little and I saw it for the first time, absolutely terrifying because I was someone who went to the beach, right? My kids watched it for the first time. They're kind of like, no, I mean, the thought of it is scary, but the movie itself, they didn't feel like it was. And of course, they want to like bag on like the special effects and all that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, 1975 is the starting point for what we call the summer blockbuster. So I said it was mentioned that it, I mentioned it being a horror movie or a quasi horror movie. But in 1976, the big summer hit was The Omen. That's right, Damien. Uh, let's see, adjusted for inflation was 257.7 million. So, of course, not at the level of Jaws, but to think that The Omen was the summer blockbuster is so interesting to me. Production budget of $2.8 million, and it did, at the time, $60.9 million at the box office. So that's where it was, you know, the margin is fantastic, right? So that was the follow-up summer blockbuster. So ostensibly, two horror movies, one straight-out horror, the other kind of horror. So 1977, I think you all know what this one was. Now, this is what I saw in the movie theater. I was obviously very little. I've told the story before going to a drive in with my dad in his van and, you know, being hidden in the back under pillows, like doing something completely clandestine till we get inside and pay the least amount of money, pop open the back, come out from under the pillows. Boom. You get to watch the movie. And that movie, which was a double feature with one of the Clint Eastwood, I think, dirty haired movies. And I'm talking about 1977's Star Wars. Again, adjusted for inflation, 1.6 billion, 1.6 billion, a production budget of 11 million with a domestic product at the time, domestic gross of 461 million. Like 461 million at the time is huge, right? So think about it. The first one, Jaws, domestically was 260 million. Star Wars did 461. So, of course, I don't really need to go into what, you know, the story is of Star Wars. You all know what it is, but it certainly made George Lucas a massive Hollywood directing star. 1978, another movie that I saw in the movie theater with my aunt at this little tiny hole in the wall theater in Wallingford, Connecticut. And I'm talking about the Olivia Newton-John, John Travolta vehicle, Grease. Talk about margin. Production budget of just $6 million. Domestic gross of $190 million. Adjusted for inflation, $694.7 million. Now, I will maintain this till the day that I die. 
Yes, Grease is a classic. Okay, it is. It's an amazing musical. But for my money, I'm a big Grease 2 fan. I know. I just think it's great. Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, Maxwell Caulfield, Adrian Smed. I'm a Grease 2 guy. But anyway, at the time, 1978, Grease was the big winner. So it was a musical, right? So you've gone horror, quasi-horror, horror, sci-fi, musical, back to horror for 1979's Amityville Horror. That's with what, um, Brolin, right? Uh, the elder Brolin, James Brolin, right? Margot Kidder. This was a production budget of just $4.7 million. It did 86.4 at the box office, adjusted for inflation. That is $310.3 million. Now, I think we all know the story, but uh, a house in Amityville, Long Island. The house is very real. It's, it is there. And there is an actual story about a, a man uh, who murdered six members of his family there and blamed it on the house. And of course, I think it was investigated by those same folks who are in, uh, what are those movies, Conjurings and all that. I think it's the same two people. I'm, I'm running a, a blank on their name. Um, I want to call it like Diane, but I don't think that's right. Um, so in the, in the real story, it's, you know, the Lutz family. Uh, historical basis. No, it's uh, the the real name is uh, the DeFeo DeFeo family. Ronald DeFeo Jr. Um, so let's see. Um, who are the people who investigated this? Yeah, it's not coming up here. It'll hit me later. Do you know how many times I'm just like driving in my car and I just remember something I had been thinking about on the podcast and I'm just like, oh my gosh, why have you come to my brain now when it is the least useful? Yeah, I can't find the name of those people who do all the investigations. Ah, here it is. Ed and Lorraine Warren. Ed and Lorraine Lauren. That is not Diane. I don't know, the Lorraine, Diane, not even close. But yeah, that's the family. Um, They have the occult museum because they have the doll. Like that, that Annabelle, I think, they have the doll at their house. So that rounds out the 70s. So the 70s is the the first decade. So the mid to end of, so, so 75 to 79, you have the advent of the summer blockbuster. So now it's a thing. Firmly established. And we now are about to have our first sequel. And I'm talking about 1980s. The Empire Strikes Back. Now, I've said it before on the Star Wars episode. Empire is not my favorite. My favorite will be down uh, the list a little bit a couple years later. So, yeah, that's a huge spoiler. But think about this. In everything we know about Lucas and Disney and all that, and these huge budgets for movies, and how economical George Lucas really was, he gets some criticism about his directing style of being uh, faster, more intense, right? That's his direction. But that's because he wanted to limit the number of takes so he can come in really tight on budget. But for 18 million domestic gross at the time of 290. Now I would thought I would have thought that was higher. Uh, but again, adjusted for inflation, 884.6 million dollars. So clearly, this is a lucrative, lucrative franchise. Um, and of course, we get the debut of Boba Fett, still kind of part of the mythos. Uh, obviously, a series on Disney. We have Lando Calrissian, who makes his first appearance as well. And we really get a little bit more of a picture of what the Emperor is all about. We get Yoda. 
and some backstory about the Jedi. And you already have the early building blocks of Lucas kind of shoehorning in or retconning that original Star Wars script. But still, in limited opening in 126 theaters in May, the movie rang up 4.9 million unadjusted and was the number one movie and had a, a wider release one month later. So in June, boom, off we go to the races. So talk about people who dominate these charts, right? So next, you have the guy who directed the very first blockbuster partnering with the guy who just had a 1977 and a 1980 blockbuster, along with some guy named Harrison Ford. And we're talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark. Talk about just, hey, here's our budget. Here's what we can do. Once again, like Empire Strikes Back, we're looking at $18 million, and it did $248.2 million at the box office. You adjust that for inflation, $797.8 million. I mean, I know that it is considered, I don't know, one of the, the greatest of all time. I know that some people kind of have a weird feeling about Temple of Doom, but I actually think Temple of Doom is really, really good. But that's neither here nor there. Raiders of the Lost Ark, when it first came out, was rated PG. Now, if I remember correctly, this was the movie that kind of set up what would become PG-13. Now, I, I didn't know. So my parents were divorced. I don't know how much or how little they ever talked about things, particularly from a a parenting perspective, I'm imagining not much. My dad went and took me to see this. And <laughs> my mom was not pleased. So I'm seven years old. And even though, again, my kids see it all these years later and contextually, they find the special effects to be hokey. To them, it might as well be Beetlejuice at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark and the face melting. At the time, that was groundbreaking. Little smidge of nightmare fuel. So my mom was not super thrilled with my dad for taking me because she had gone with her boyfriend at the time, so she already knew what was happening. But here we have Steven Spielberg and George Lucas now on the charts a few times. Like, they are the architects of the summer blockbuster. And of course, who doesn't want to punch a Nazi, right? Hey, 1982, guess who's here? Spielberg, E.T., the extraterrestrial. Oh, okay. So one of the things I, I, I want to cover real quick, so we're, we're going to go backwards just a smidge here. So I was too young for Jaws or the Omen, see Star Wars at a drive-in. Greece, I see in a little tiny theater. Didn't see Amityville Horror. Kudos to the parents there. I did see Empire Strikes Back in the movie theater. I did see Raiders of the Lost Ark in the movie theater. I also saw E.T. the Extraterrestrial in the movie theater. And that was uh, 10.5 million, brought in 435.1 for a 1.28 billion adjusted for uh, inflation. And this is where we all really got introduced to Drew Barrymore, uh, Henry Thomas. Um, and another big, you know, Spielberg movie. Now, what's interesting is that Close Encounters, what year was Close Encounters? I saw that in the movie theater, too, or at least I saw it in a, because sometimes there's this uh, place in Berlin, Connecticut, that would play older movies or movies that were no longer considered first release. 77. I remember that whole closing scene in the movie theater. And part of it is because my aunt and uncle had driven cross country and they had pictures of that landmark. Oh gosh. What is it called? Um, let's see the devil's tower. Yeah. The devil's tower. Um, which is kind of a trippy looking place. And they had taken photos of it. 
And I just had such a strong memory of of that from both the movie theater and the kid, like, you know, with his uh, mashed potatoes kind of making it because, you know, he's being visited by aliens or whatever. Anyway, but back to E.T. Um, E.T. has some harrowing moments in it as much as it has all the magic, right? All that stuff with, like, the military coming in and, like, E.T., you think he's dead, he's sickly, it's just a biohazard situation and what they would do to what they consider to be a, a biological agent and how they lock it all down, like the fear of the kids. Pretty intense, actually. It's not such a happy-go-lucky, you know, movie. Was that... Let's see. I'm I'm not sure if it was rated. I'm pretty sure it was rated PG, right? I do know they've adjusted some ratings. Um where is it? I don't know. It's not showing it here. They usually have the rating. Rated PG. Rated PG. Um, yeah, it was pretty intense. It was pretty intense. So now, 1983, Return of the Jedi. Now, this has quite the budget, surprisingly. She's gone from 18 million, right? The first one was like 7 million, 18 million. Here we have a $32.5 million budget. That's a lot. So even then, unadjusted, it brought in $309.3 million. So ratio not as good, like the profit margin. But then when you look at it, adjusted for inflation, $847.5 million. That, to me, is my favorite Star Wars movie. It, it just, it is. You get to see that glimpse of the badass Luke. That whole opening sequence with Jabba, all of it, that's what you wanted to see. That's what we wanted when they brought the whole thing back, the Disney years. That's what we wanted. But you also have, like, super, like, crush-worthy Princess Leia at that time. Boba Fett gets jobbed out, which is rough. But even, you know, just, just Jabba was intense, and how it built, and the story, and the redemption, the redemption arc of one Anakin Skywalker. Yeah, 1983. Saw that in the movie theater. I also saw that in the place in Wallingford, by the way. 1984. Um, who are you going to call? The Ghostbusters. Talk about a all-star cast. Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Sigourney Weaver, Rick Moranis, Ernie Hudson. Um, oh my gosh, Egon, Harold Remus. I didn't have to look it up. That's excellent. Um, thirty million dollar budget. It did two hundred forty two point two million at the box office, adjusted for inflation, six hundred forty one point three million. Got to tell you, you know, part of it it says here is that Sigourney Weaver had already faced down extraterrestrial terror in Aliens, but plays up the demonic laughs in Ghostbusters. It has legitimate scares, though. That's what's so great, you know? And the moments where, you know, um, you know, Bill Murray is always playing the sarcasm, right? Always. Binkman, right? But there's moments where he has to be serious, right? And there's moments where he has to go, wow, this is kind of scary. And the way that he could weave that kind of in and out was so great. And, of course, Dan Aykroyd is remarkably, I think, underrated. Truly. My favorite turn of his, uh, Gross Point Blank, it's so good, so out of character, really top-notch. So, love it. So, 1984, saw that in movie theater. 1985, I went on a pseudo-date. Long story, won't get into that today, but nevertheless, back to the future, 19 million, domestic budget of 
six, uh, excuse me, uh, gross of 210.6, adjusted for inflation, 532 million. And this, of course, directed by Robert Zemeckis. However, if I remember correctly, this was produced by Spielberg, wasn't it? Let me double check that. Let me do a fact check. Um, you know, what's funny is that I know it's a trilogy, but I have never really gotten into Back to the Future 3. Uh, let's see. Oh, so the production company is Amblin Entertainment, which was Steven Spielberg's production company. So that's why. But yeah, uh, Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd, Leah Thompson, Crispin Glover, love Crispin Glover, uh, and Thomas, Thomas F. Wilson. I mean, legendary, classic, uh, it, it holds up. And the whole thing is, you know, it could have ended with the cliffhanger and never done subsequent episodes, and it would have held up all by itself. But of course, now we're in the era of franchises and trying to go ahead and milk the characters for everything they're worth. Now, when you could do it in a in a trilogy as they did, kind of nicely sums it all up. But again, number three, never got into it. I think I will have to watch it, force myself to watch it. But saw that in movie theater. 1986. <sighs> okay, so confessional time. I never liked this movie, but I did like its sequel. I'm talking about 1986 Top Gun. $15 million for a budget. It brought in $179.8 million for a adjusted for inflation number of $432.8 million. I look at this movie. So that's directed by Tony Scott, of course. We have Ridley and Tony Scott. Tony Scott is unfortunately no longer with us. Um, but um, Tom Cruise, Val Kilmer, oh, Val Kilmer. Tom Skerritt, Kelly McGillis, Anthony Edwards. So my stepfather and my uncle, two people that I adore close to, and both audiophiles, right? Always want to have the biggest, baddest system, and this was component systems, and you got your subwoofers, you got your surround sound and all that, okay? And they both would get so jazzed up about the sound production on Top Gun. Without a doubt, it is tremendous, okay? Particularly if you're rocking full subwoofer, right? The, the, the roar of the jets, right? The roar of those jet engines. Amazing, right? Navy fighters. Very cool. That movie is a romance. I'm sorry. When one of your main themes is Take My Breath Away, which, by the way, I love the soundtrack to this movie. I just never got in to, like, the, I don't know. It just, it never struck me. Maybe it's because I didn't find Kelly McGillis and Tom Cruise to have the requisite chemistry, perhaps. Um... Yeah, I never gravitated to it, but let me tell you, Top Gun Maverick was freaking good, man. I really, really enjoyed the sequel because I feel like they, it wasn't just like a a romance. I don't know. I just will always think of Top Gun as being a, a romance with jets. And I am like a huge Val Kilmer fan, by the way, like Val Kilmer, probably like he's in my top 10 for sure. Maybe top five, just singular performances ever in Tombstone. But yeah, I never got into the original Top Gun. Now we watched it. It's enjoyable. The kids dug it, but um, yeah, never got into it. So I never saw it in the movie theater. What I did see in the movie theater 
And oddly enough, we have a sequel here where the original was not a summer blockbuster. Beverly Hills Cop 2. $28 million budget. Brought in $153.7 million. 354 when adjusted for inflation. Of course, you have Axel Foley played by Eddie Murphy. You have uh, Judge Reinhold. Um, it was, let's see. Uh, his star power lifted the film to the top on its open weekend in late May, and it was the her- third highest grossing film in 87. Now, if that's the big summer blockbuster, uh, what was... The top for all of 1987. Interesting. Um, that's a great question. Um, 1987. Highest grossing film. Now, this is saying. Third? What? (laughs) Okay. So they have what's called the highest grossing films of 87 by calendar, by calendar gross. And then they have highest grossing films by in-year release, right? So it was released late in the year, for example. Number one for this time period. Is this true? Because it was released in November. Okay. Okay. Released in November, you have three men and a baby directed by anyone? Anyone? Leonard Nimoy. Isn't that a mind blower? But... Ted Danson, Tom Selleck, Steve Gutenberg, crazy, absolutely crazy, directed by, of all people, Leonard Nimoy. But that was technically, for the calendar year, it was Beverly Hills Cop. Number two was Platoon, and number three was Fatal Attraction. Yeah, so, saw it in the movie theater. Oh, my gosh. I saw this one too. I did. I, 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 it took me a moment to go. Yeah, I'm like ninety five percent sure. Because there still wasn't. We weren't doing a ton of video then. But who framed Roger Rabbit? Yeah, I did. I definitely saw it in the movie theater. Now that I'm thinking about it, because it's talking about the second gro- highest grossing film. I saw a bunch of movies that year. Because also in 1988 was Rain Man. I saw that in the movie theater. So we're looking at a production budget of seventy million for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, domestic gross of one hundred and fifty six point five, and then adjusted for inflation, we have three hundred forty three. Now, is that also Robert Zemeckis? I think so. Roger Rabbit. Now, of course, this was followed. When I when I say followed, I mean kind of the genre of mixed media. Um. Yeah, Robert Zemeckis. I thought so. Um, cool World with uh, Brad Pitt and uh, Kim Basinger. Basinger? Basinger? Anyway. Oh, next we have a, a banger of a movie that, interestingly enough, is also very, very topical. Because you have someone who is back in the movies. Kind of like a really... Late, late sequel, tangential sequel, multiversal sequel, if you will. I'm talking about Tim Burton's 1989 masterpiece, Batman. $35 million budget brought in 251.3. Seems low, honestly. Everyone was walking around with the bat symbol on their chest. Everyone had a Batman t-shirt. It was cool to have Batman. Now, as a comic geek, it's now like annoying that all these people are wearing it. It's like, you don't, you don't even read comics. And, you know, the nerds, the geeks are all reading our comics, and now all of a sudden you think it's cool. But it was cool. Uh, adjusted for inflation, $567 million. But, yeah, 
Tim Burton, Michael Keaton as Batman. Of course, you have Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Kim Basinger, who I mentioned, you also have Jerry Hall in it. Um, it didn't end well for her in that particular movie. And really, up until Heath Ledger, like, N Nicholson's portrayal was considered the definitive one. But, I mean, I grew up with Cesar Romero. It was, a, it was a different type of Joker, but nevertheless, the Flash movie, that's dropping. I got to go see that movie theater. Whether anyone wants to go with me or not, I don't care. I've seen movies all by myself in the movie theater. I'm good with it. But, yeah, The Flash is coming out with Michael Keaton returning to the role as Batman in a alternate timeline, screwed up universe kind of thing. I mean, come on, Michael Keaton. Not my favorite Batman, by the way. Sorry, Christian Bale, the best. Just, it just, my opinion, the, the, the Nolan stuff, fantastic. But Batman, saw it in the movie theater. <laughs> oh boy, this next one, I went on a date and I saw this one. Nineteen nineties Ghost Starring Brat Packer to me more. Tangential to the Brat Pack, Mr. Patrick Swayze. We have Whoopi Goldberg, who won an Oscar Best Supporting Actress as the Psychic. Twenty two million dollar budget, two hundred and seventeen point six at the box office, adjusted for inflation, four hundred and sixty three point seven million dollars. And kind of a badass, scary ending. Like the resolution with like demonic activity was intense, right? The 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 killer, the murderer, how that all ended. Kind of cool. It's all now look, if a movie is gonna tell you flat out it's it's a romance, I'm I'm fine with it contextually. Not my favorite genre, but there are good romances that I enjoy. But yeah, that was uh the movie opened in mid-July. And had the second highest domestic gross of any film in 1990 after the Christmas movie, Home Alone. But again, we're talking about summer, summer blockbusters. And if you have a mid-July opening, it's firmly in the summer. Yeah, saw that one. I guess I went and saw all the big blockbusters, right? Now here we have arrived at 1991. And the film that some would say is the single greatest movie ever. And now I've just heard that recently, a few people who have said, without a doubt, it is the greatest movie of all time. Now, when you have things like Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz and think of some, I don't know, think of any movie that has won an Oscar because of amazing, like uh, Saving Private Ryan right? Against Spielberg, right? But no. 1991's Terminator 2 Judgment Day. James Cameron, right? Now, I saw the original Terminator in the movie theater, too, by the way, and that was the first time I saw boobies on screen. Um, lifelong crush on Linda Hamilton. Um, I was just a wee lad. When was the original? Um, let's say 84, I was 10. Oh, so I'm actually, no, first time I saw the, the real boobies, because, uh, I think I had mentioned on a podcast that, uh, heavy metal, the animated film was the first time I, I saw them. I was like eight. <laughs> okay. So Cameron gets $102 million to basically have a sequel to a, you know, like I said, 84, so not quite a decade prior, but, you know, interesting, but a good story. Uh, 205.9 at the box office. I'm surprised. That seems low to me because you had it come out with a hit single of um, You Could Be Mine by Guns N' Roses. And I mean, this was, it seems it was everywhere, right? It was everywhere. Adjusted for inflation at four hundred thirty nine point four million, but you have Arnold Schwarzenegger, you have Ed Furlong, you have Robert Patrick as the what is it T two thousand? Oh man, 
the the special effects, that whole liquid metal thing, like that was groundbreaking, groundbreaking. And yeah, that was a hell of a show. Got to tell you, um, just all that stuff with like the the shotgun, right? And how Schwarzenegger's just one arm in it as the cyborg. They learned how to do it for real. It's very cool. In 1992. Also a date. Is it a date? 92? No. Maybe not. Did I go with the guys on this? I don't remember. But Batman Returns. Second installment with Michael Keaton. You have Danny DeVito as the Penguin. Awesome casting, awesome performance. You have Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. How did she become Catwoman? You have Christopher Walken at his worst, which is the best. $80 million budget, 162.9 at the box office, adjusted for inflation, 353.6. Love that series. Tim Burton, fantastic. Now, here we're starting to get into the time period where I wasn't necessarily always going to the movies particularly these next let's see uh the next few i only saw one in the movie theater okay so the uh next one 1993 we have uh, steven spielberg once again on the list with jurassic park which is where we're getting the point where jeff goldblum was like considered like box office money right because he was in blockbuster after blockbuster 63 million budget, 402.8 at the box office. Nowadays, that's worth 825.9 million. Well, actually, this article that, that gives you a nice listing of all of them in order does stop at 2019. So with inflation being what it is, all that's higher. So let's see. Um, but I didn't see that in movie theater. I saw that in video later on. The next one wasn't interested at all. Ended up watching it like a million times with my kid sister on video, but that's 1994's The Lion King. $45 million budget, 422.8 the box office, and 803.2 million adjusted for inflation. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I wasn't a huge Disney guy. Like, I, I really wasn't. I think I was always kind of, so I had, okay, I just jumped back and forth. From a animated watching perspective, it was Warner Brothers. It was Looney Tunes, right? That whole universe. But my grandmother got like a book of the month club for me. And it was always kept at her house. I wasn't allowed to take them home. And that was like the Disney, you know, the gold binding books, you know, little little golden books, whatever. But they had a whole thing of it that was just Disney. And she was like on this subscription service that all these Disney books. So I read the Disney books, but I watched the Warner Brothers movies. Does that make sense? Anyway, didn't see The Lion King until my sister had it on video. But I did go to the movie for 1995's Batman Forever. Now, when Joe Sch Joel Schumacher took over, now Joel Schumacher is a fine director, but he was going back to the Adam West, like campy when we've moved away into like the darker Batman, right? Which I think was totally right for the time, right? So to go camp in 95, I, I don't know. I could see it kind of going both ways, but you had Val Kilmer, who I love, Val Kilmer. I thought he was a fine Batman. Less believable though as Bruce Wayne, just my opinion. You have Harvey Dent, a.k.a. Two-Face, being played by Tommy Lee Jones, and the Riddler, played by Jim Carrey. So all of the actors were were great as far as characterization, like, good casting. Movie wasn't great. You know what I mean? Had a budget of $100 million, and at the time, only brought in $184.1 million. Only 84.1 profit margin. That's not necessarily great, but for a summer, it was the big one. Uh, the film opened on June 16th and wiped out the competition. It did $52 million just the opening weekend. Yeah, it's interesting. That's uh, about a quarter of what it did total. 
Yeah, it's very, very strange. Anyway, Val Kilmer, fine Batman. Next one, didn't see it in the movie theater. It is number two in the Jeff Goldblum is money. We have Independence Day starring uh, Will uh, get your uh, get my wife's name out your mouth Smith with a production budget of 75 million, a domestic uh, gross of 306. If you adjust that for inflation, 624.1. You know, I don't know that I've ever seen it. I'm not sure I've seen Independence Day. Um, I don't think I have. I don't think I have to this day. I don't know. Never really interested me. Like anything about it. Is that a Paxton Pullman? Paxton Pullman? Pullman Paxton? But one of them is the president. I'm pretty sure. But like the White House gets nuked by aliens, right? That was like the iconic scene. But yeah, never saw it. 1997. Did not see it in the movie theater. Saw it immediately when it was available for rental. Rental. <laughs> also, Will Smith. Along with Tommy Lee Jones, we have Men in Black, 492.1 million uh, uh, adjusted for inflation. It was a 90 million budget, gross 250 at the time. Great series. Honestly, the interplay between Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones is legendary. It is chemistry at its finest. And it even worked when you had, you know, Josh Brolin playing the younger K. Like, it's good stuff. Like, a great series. Um, but yeah, I saw all those on video, never in the movie theater. Did we see two? I'm thinking like with my wife, maybe we saw two in the movie theater, but I don't quite remember. So we're only going to go up to 2000, right? Well, actually 1999. Cause I always think about like the, the youngest Xers, right? And if those are 1979, right, we're going to go, you know, 20 years, 1999, and we're going to end it there. So we're almost there. Who's back on the list? <laughs> so rounding out the 90s. 1998. Steven Spielberg's amazing war epic. Saving Private Ryan. $70 million budget. 217 at the box office. Adjusted for inflation, four hundred and twelve point seven million. I mean, you get a war movie, critically acclaimed, great performances. I'm not a huge Tom Hanks fan. He's excellent, excellent in this. There are so many little details. Oh, who's the sniper? Um, Barry. Oh my gosh. It's with an F, right? Um, what is his name? Let's see. What's that cast here? Barry Pepper. Woo! I was close. Barry Pepper. He is so good in that. Of course, Matt Damon, uh, Ed Burns, Tom Sizemore, Giovanni Ribisi, Vin Diesel, Adam Goldberg, and Jeremy Davies. I remember going to the movie theater with my now wife. And, um, yeah, that movie, that starts out intense. You know what I mean? Not what you consider to be necessarily a summer kind of blockbuster fare. It's long and it's grueling, but it's top freaking notch. And there, there are many who have said that World War II veterans who have seen the film were so moved saying that it was the most accurate depiction of war as they fought it in, in film history. So kudos to Mr. Spielberg. But then rounding out for 1999, surprise, surprise, if you have Spielberg, then you must have... George Lucas. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. $115 million budget. Right out of Lucasfilm. He did it himself, right? It did $474.5 million at the box office. 
adjusted for inflation, 813.7. And I have to tell you, there are some who say it's awful, right? Oh, Phantom Menace is terrible. And, you know, well, oh, who's that kid that plays Anakin? I'm drawing a blank on his name at the moment. Um, you get Darth Maul. You get Liam Neeson. Um, Ewan McGregor. I mean, such a great cast. Oh, what is that kid's name? I want to say it's something Lloyd, right? Um, let's see here. Phantom Menace. Jake Lloyd. I loved it. I loved it. That whole soundtrack, Duel of Fates, that whole sequence with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan and Darth Maul is breathtaking and suspenseful, like truly suspenseful. And I was working overnight at the time. So I went after work. There was like a 10 a.m. showing at this little theater over by Copley. And I went and saw it in the movie theater. And I saw it probably, let's see. Oh, you know what? It, th that movie theater was not the first time I saw it. Unfortunately, the first time I saw it, we had just flown to Nebraska. No, wait. This came out when? Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, so I saw this in the movie theater. At that little theater. Uh, I'm just picturing it. Um, it's over by a place now called Bukowski's. Um, there's like a, um, a bowling alley there now. What was the name of that theater? Anyway, I saw it there during the day at like 10 a.m. The second time I went to see it, which was for Christmas because my brother-in-law had never seen it. So we decided that we were going to go and see it after we had just flown in. So we travel all day and I fell asleep during the pod racing scene. Now, it's not my favorite part of anything in Star Wars, but I still think it's really enjoyable now. But yeah, I'd seen it once myself that opening weekend, and then we saw it uh, in December um, at a theater out in Nebraska. So that brings us to 1999, and we're going to end it there. It's just amazing how many times Spielberg and Lucas are on here. I mean, it's quite impressive, really. I mean, they are two of the preeminent big movie guys ever. Now, of course, Spielberg has much more critical acclaim than Lucas. Because when Lucas would do a more serious film, it usually didn't get the kind of distribution that Spielberg stuff got. So let's see. Lucas did that World War II movie, something Hawks. Um, let's see, George Lucas. Um, the Black Unit of Pilots, also from World War II. Um, and I'm pretty sure he directed it. Maybe he only produced it, though. Uh, let's see. Filmography. Oh, yeah, so he did not direct it. Um, Red Tails. So he was the producer. That's Terrence Howard, uh, Cuba Gooden Jr. as the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, yeah, but that was just production. I thought you wrote it and even perhaps directed it, but I guess not. So I guess really his his directing credits, it's either like the physical graf uh, American graffiti, not physical graffiti, American graffiti and like Star Wars. That was really about it. Um Curious. Yeah, so George Lucas has directed one, two, three, four, five, six, six total movies. 
and sold his property for a gajillion dollars. Amazing. Simply amazing. So is there anything that you're looking forward to that's coming out this summer? I know for myself, really wanted to get to the movies to see a couple of things. Again, my wife and I were like, oh, we're going to go see this movie. We're going to go see it. And honestly, we, as soon as it became available for streaming, for rental, well, not even rental, I bought it. John Wick 4. The visuals on that are so gorgeous that I do think I would like to still see it on the big screen. If you haven't seen it yet, it is poetic. You know, people talk about like the John Woo stuff as being uh, ballet, right? And all these great visuals and sequences. And John Woo is amazing, by the way. Absolutely amazing. But Chad Stalski has come such a long way as a director and uh, kudos to whoever does the cinematography. Just gorgeous. I still want to see Guardians in the Galaxy. I think that's the kind of movie you got to see on the big screen as well. Um, yeah, I got to see The Flash when that comes out. I'm trying to think what else is is upcoming. I know there's um oh Into the Spider Verse. Definitely want to go see that. So there's definitely some summer blockbusters that I want to check out. But I, I look at some of the lists like so past that 1999. Um. I'm like looking, I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Like I've seen like one, 2002. Uh, let's see. Oh, interesting. Attack of the Clones was not a summer blockbuster. Isn't that curious? Huh. That is the worst of the Star Wars films, not going to lie. Well, anyway, what are you looking forward to? And what are your favorite blockbusters? So I just want to say this last episode, you know, to, to listener Michael, thank you for posting over on the Spotify page, some great information, great content about a, a kind of companion video that had been put out by uh, a group called Wisecrack that was kind of going through the same thing about the, the, the dumbing down of culture. Now, they did not blame Gen X, by the way, they kind of made it seem like we were anti-nostalgia and like we still had our cool factor. So chances are they're millennials and they don't quite fully get us because I we're at, I think, a different place in our lives. Like it was almost like describing us as uh, aspirationally as we l used to look at ourselves, which I think is less re relevant and real as I kind of talked about last week. But I love having interactions like that. If there's something that you think that I'd be interested in seeing or other listeners would be interested in, please send it my way. I love to learn new things and see new things. So please, that'd be great. So how can you let me know? You can email me at stuckinthemiddlepod at yahoo.com. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at StuckPodX. You can head on over to the Facebook page, Stuck in the Middle of Gen X Podcast. Please like, share, comment, leave five-star reviews, and most importantly, please subscribe to the podcast. So until next time, later, slackers.